Come on now, people. I've been telling you for almost two years now, you need to have a GNR TV. And now, sports are back. Football is back. Now is the perfect time for you to get this if you don't have it already. And if you look on over here, as I've been telling you before, you get all these amazing channels, every single one of them, for $20 a month for two devices. And if you look on up over here, it's written. It's written everything you get with GNR TV. If you want four devices, $40. And there's some cool extras right here. GNR TV, streaming done right. If you don't have it, get it. What more can I say? What more can I say? It's time to cut the damn cord, stop being ripped off by the dish and cable, and get this lovely thing we call GNR TV. Streaming done right. Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmares. Well, this Jason's mask. And just, ladies and gentlemen, how's it going? I have... My guest CJ Graham on my podcast, and how's it going, CJ? Hey, good, Aaron. Thanks for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. I can't, I can't express myself as far as uh, humble and appreciative you have me on your show. Thank you. And I feel the same exact way for you coming on my show as we were just talking a few minutes ago. I've been watching these movies, the whole franchise, since I was a little kid. Starting out with on the USA Network, and of course on TV they cut out of the blood, guts, and boobs. But you still get that feeling of Jason. You still get some of the, you know, you, you still get the emotions of Jason. And then when I finally got to see it on VHS, I was just like, oh, my goodness. And then I remember when the DVDs first came out, it was the box set of DVDs came out in a little black box. My brother Henry and I went and got it that weekend. I don't remember if we took the bus or my mother drove us or whatever, but we watched that whole franchise that weekend. Can't tell you how many times, but it was just like. And now I have you on my show. Like I, it's it's just crazy because you, I never thought that would happen. Like, obviously podcasts weren't out then, but still, you never think that you'll be able to have a conversation with someone you grew up watching and a fan of. And that I'm just humbled and so happy that you came on the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure. You know, it's funny because some of your fans out there are going to go, "What's a VHS?" <laughs> <laughs> You're so right about that. Well, back when we had to go to the video store and rent movies, you had, you had to actually leave the house to rent a movie. You can't just do it at the convenience of the remote, which I missed. Yeah, Blockbuster was big and large. Yes, Blockbuster. We had a place called, it was called um, Screen Gems by us. There was a Blockbuster too, but there was a Screen Gems like right up the street, actually in walking distance. And once we got a little older, my mother let us, you know, here's a couple of dollars, go up there and get your movies or your games or whatever and come back. Okay. Missed those days. I missed those days so much. <laughs> yeah, a little more simple, huh? Yes, a lot more simple. But I did, um, I did, <clears throat> excuse me, I rewatched Vengeance today, actually, as I was working. And that's a very interesting film, an interesting story. I like the storyline of that film. Yeah, you know, um, uh, Jason Brooks plays Jason, and uh, Mr. Brown did a, a good job. You know, it's, you know, I think looking back on it, and I'm not the expert, I think there's some things they would tweak a little differently. I mean, to maintain the storyline and make sure. In part six, as you were saying, it's it's a fan favorite, fortunately for me. And if you think about it, we don't have any nudity and or swearing in part six, yet it still has that Friday the 13th flavor. Um, you know, you can have all the nude scenes you want to a point, but they're not there to watch a nude scene as much as they are there to see a couple lose connection and then get killed by Jason. So there are some things are a little uh, bold. You know, it's to me, you can have a beautiful t-shirt on a beautiful girl and it's going to serve the same thing. And if she takes the top off uh, in a film and the part about bringing Elias Voorhees to the subject matter, which is Jason's father and allowing me to play it was a true honor. Uh, I grew a beard about four months, maybe four and a half months. Uh, So it's my beard and they put a stringy wig on me and 
Jason Brooks is about the same size as me in height. I might be a little thicker. Uh, and he did a good job where like everybody thinks about it. I mean, how cool is that to play Jason? And then 35 years later, 34 years later, play his father. And now you just can't wait to see how Jason got his DNA. Yeah, see, now that's cool. How, now, how did that feel playing Elias Voorhees, like standing face to face with a character you played thirty some odd years ago? You know it was I mean? great. I mean, I'm very humble about the the fact that I did Friday the Thirteenth. Um, very proud. You know, it was my first film ever, uh, and the success unexpectedly in today, 2020. Mm-hmm. You got to realize in 1986, the top movie at the box office, if I recall, was Top Gun. So Friday the 13th was just that. It was a real calling for those that wanted to watch that type of horror, which in today's element has grown it's just huge as a result of not just social media, but the accessibility through streaming and filming and social networks to watch them. So you don't have to go down the street to get a VHS mm-hmm. and rent it per se. You can go to YouTube in some cases and watch it. So that has helped uh, levitate and a better launching platform for us in the Friday the 13th series. So it's very cool. I think that's awesome, though, like what you're just saying, as far as the whole streaming thing, like it makes it a lot easier for people to access it. And what I love about that, too, as well with the social media, is you meet, like I've met so many awesome people through this podcast that are just fans of horror. And I think that's, I think it's awesome because you grow, like growing up, especially minorities, I'll say, they're not expecting, not everybody's expecting us to like horror. You know what I mean? Especially other minor, they're not expecting it. And then it's cool that, I mean, of course the people that I grew up with is one thing, but it's cool that I've met people through, you know, through Facebook, through cons and all that stuff, all different nationalities, all different, everything. And it's like the one place where I feel like when you go to a horror convention, it's like all the BS is left right outside the door and everybody's just there because they're fans of that genre. And I think it's, I wish the whole world can be like that. And I wish you know what I mean? Like another thing with the horror conventions versus I'll say like a comic con convention from my experience is, and I could be wrong, but I feel like with comic con and all those type of conventions, not all, but some people are going there to support say their child or their significant other or their friend, you know, but I feel like with horror, everybody that's there actually wants to be, they're a fan of horror. Like they want it from the kids to the grandparents. They want to be there. There's at least one person there they want to see one from one film or whatever the case may be and they go there and just have a great time and it's just it's they're like the nicest people in the world which if you're not a fan of horror you're just like really but really nicest people in the world yeah one thing i'll tell you Aaron, about a, a, a horror convention um is there is no purple green or blue exactly. and it doesn't matter if you're from pluto venus or mars everybody's there under the pretense of enjoying Mm-hmm. the atmosphere. And I mean that completely. Um, I don't use colors and ethnic groups and, and countries. I just say purple, green, or blue, Pluto, Venus, or Mars. Um, and you could see a school teacher in there getting an autograph right next to a business person, right next to a person who you may not have dinner with, but you're like, you like whore? Yeah. Uh, example, you know, I had a, a, a lady come up to me and get an autograph uh, last year. I just, hey, what are you going to do with it? Didn't think, you know, what are you going to do with the autograph? I'm going to put it on my desk. And I'm thinking, oh, great. What do you do? She goes, well, I'm a colonel in the United States Air Force. So I'm looking at this lady thinking, great, I'm a sergeant. I walk into your office uh, to report, and you've got a picture of Jason on the back desk. Now, number one, that's scary. But more importantly, how, as a person, non-commissioned officer or a person of less rank, how embraceive is that going to be, see? Seriously, Colonel, you're a Friday the 13th fan. And it is a true statement, Aaron. When you look around, purple, green, or blue, everybody's in line having a good time talking. I have never, ever, ever seen a conflict of any type at a convention, any type, not even just where somebody was drunk and acting dumb, let alone somebody didn't like somebody's hair color or their shoes. Um, Everybody is just having a great time. And there is no they, me, who... It's purple, green, or blue. Everybody's having a good time. Yeah, that, that's I love that. I mean, the only I won't even say issue. There's never been issues I've seen, but of course the fun, friendly debates. You know, Freddie versus Jason and stuff like that. But that's just fun banter. And I'll say the one thing about um, I'm a very impatient person. Like if my wife was in here, she would tell you. Like we go grocery shopping, and all this stuff. The lines are long. I'm, I'm there's been times where I've gone by myself and I just left. <laughs> like forget it. 
but at a horror convention in those lines it's just completely different i'm just like i'm i'm fine in this line or whatever but i think it's more so because you're in an environment where you know everybody's a fan of i mean if they're in the same line as you they're at least a fan of that franchise or from one of the movies that you played in and you're just talking about the horror so it goes by like this and i'm just like well that's what you're saying is everybody around you um again is purple green or blue everybody around you embraces the environment they're in there is no judgment no line no i mean here's you know i did a show uh and i think it was in either kentucky or virginia and you know i'm sitting there next to me is alice cooper well next to alice cooper is william shatner star trek and next to him was the fawns and you know there's lou frigno across the way the karate kid and stuff and i'm like these are even us as actors and actresses in different genres. I mean, Star Trek versus Friday the 13th, but we're in the same row signing autographs. And it gives people to cross over from, oh, I was a truckie. And, oh, but you know what? I did like Jason. And all people just kind of go, you're kidding. I never knew that about you. And it becomes a talking pivot point at the copy machine or at the bar, you know, or having dinner with a waitress or a bartender talking to you. All of a sudden you start talking about this horror genre and oh, i remember when my my brother took me to it oh i got a good story my mom made me watch it and uh, you know and they're really for the most part i've never heard a negative story of a person that was quote unquote forced to watch a friday the 13th other than at that point they became a diehard fan yeah, which i mean it's hard not to be a fan of this franchise it's just it's it, it, it's just amazing the way it is and i never knew this obviously as a kid that there was so many different actors that played Jason throughout the franchise. I, I mean, as a kid, you don't, you don't think about that stuff. You're just like, Oh cool. It's Jason. And I'm just yeah. Like, and you know, it, it's, you know, you go all the way back to part one with Ari and yeah. Ari was in it for, you know, a few minutes. Mm -hmm. He was just a young man and don't quote me, I think 12. Uh, and here he is today and he still goes to conventions. He's got a great band. He's a musician. He does a lot of great things with other things, but here he is at these conventions 40 years later and people are running up to him getting his autograph. Um, now, he's a man now. He's not a little boy anymore. But conceptionally, you know, his pictures on the table are of him as Jason coming out of the water uh, with Adrian King, and they're just in awe. And it's a very humbling experience, Aaron. Um, you know, I really enjoy meeting the fans. I enjoy the opportunities. Three decades later, we're having this conversation. Um, and then we've been able to, to stand the time, you know, of being still at the top of the list. I mean, we're not considered a list, of course, but we do have a worldwide uh, brand recognition with the hockey mask and being Jason and one of nine uh, principals that played Jason over the, 12 movies that have been uh, put out there. It's really an honor. Yeah, it's awesome. It's it's amazing. And it's funny you mentioned Ari because he was actually my very first horror autograph. I met him at a, such a really nice guy, like you're saying. I met him, it was actually at a con where I met Kevin Eastman as well, got his autograph because I'm a huge mm -hmm. sports fan. But we, we went to Ari's table like towards the end of the con. It was me, my brother, and our wives. And I remember we were just talking. That we He talked to us for like an hour because the con was pretty much over. And we each got machete, machete signed. Like from every Jason that I've met, I make sure I get a machete signed. Talking to him, talking to him. And then we're about to leave. And then he's like, hey, come here real quick, guys. So, and he just, he was like, you guys are such nice guys. You guys hung out with me for the past hour. Signed, the, um, signed pictures for us. A CD for us. And I think like something else small or whatever. But I was like, that was just. Just, just because, and I love stuff like I don't ever ask for anything. I don't expect anything, but it's just cool that I feel I like how, well, I like how much you guys are so appreciative of the fans. You know, like just it just makes us feel so good because it's like this is so cool. Like I watched this movie growing up, and then you guys are like, well, you know, if it wasn't for the fans, we wouldn't be here. But I, I say the same thing. Like if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be here as far as this these amazing movies you guys are in because I mean. Yeah, well, you, Aaron, you will tell, I mean, I can sum it up in one word, respect. Yes. Um, we respect the fans because without you, without the fans, without this podcast, 
you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So how cool is that? And you know what? I got to be fair. Sometimes luck, you know, there's luck in everything, partner. You and I are pretty good at what we do, but sometimes you're lucky to get the gig and then you got to prove your worthiness once you get the gig and you better be damn good, right? But all of us, you know, uh, Ari, uh, of course, Steve Dash passed away a couple of years ago. Um, Jer- uh, Warren Gillette is out there still with part two. Um, Richard Brooker passed away about five, five and a half years ago. Uh, you know, and we still have Mr. Ted White, 94 years old. Uh, Ted did part four, and I think he was in his late 50s when he did it as a stuntman. And to this day, I've had conversations and been on panels with Mr. White. He still sits there and goes, I've done 100 movies, and I didn't even want credits on this one. I don't have credits on it, but everybody knows me because of Jason. And I, I stood with the best, you know, John Wayne, et cetera. And it's kind of interesting to hear him just go, and everybody knows me because of Jason. So I think the cool thing, Aaron, if you want to take it a step further for us as the Friday the 13th, uh, you know, in the, in the 80s, nobody wanted to wear a mask. Hey, I, I'm an actor. I'm an actress. I want you to see my face. Yeah. And then there's people like me, like, I don't care. What's the paycheck? I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you throw a mask on, and here we're talking three decades later. But the interesting thing is, Aaron, every six, not every, a very lot of successful franchise that you see out there, they wear a mask. Arrow, Batman, Flash. Should I continue? They're all wearing masks. How, how, how ironic with the DC, the comics, the Marvel, and all these masks that are coming out of the comics of the 50s, 60s, 70s in today's era, and they're very successful franchises. Well, Jason, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, Leatherface were somewhat of the foundation for that stepping platform to go forward, and it wasn't cool to wear a mask in the 80s, don't forget, but today... It's cool. Oh, yeah. I agree with that. And I think, you know what it is with the mask, too? I mean, with the Jason mask, of course, it's so iconic. But I feel like it's it's one of those things where it's like, especially as a kid, you're you're wondering what the person looks like under that mask. Like, what does Jason look like under the mask? And it's so mysterious. You get to see it in a few of the movies. But when you finally get to see it, I'll say especially in part seven, when you really, really when you know, the mask explodes, and all, you're just like, oh, my goodness, that's so cool. And then, you know, but it's just, it's just, such an iconic, great, great thing. Like, fa- I look at it like this. Faces you'll forget, but a mask like that, like, I'm just, again, the Jason mask, everybody knows it. Well, and, and that's a great point. And, and I do say this uh, to the fans. There's, and I use an example. There's 1.3, 1.4 billion people in India. Mm. And if I take, take a picture of Tom Cruise, they'll all say Tom Cruise. Sure. If I take a picture of CJ Graham, they're going to shrug their shoulders. However, if I show them a picture of Jason the hockey mask and the hockey mask, they'll go, Jason, Friday the 13th. Mm-hmm. They know the character, and it is a brand as acknowledgeable as the face of Tom Cruise. So humbly wearing a hockey mask has been a, re- a real nice uh, success. But at the same time, most people don't know who you are at a restaurant, which is nice. But there are a lot of horror fans that I've been to TSA and had an agent check in my ID and asked me, aren't you the guy that played Jason? And I'm like, yeah. And there are people, Universal Studios, I was walking with my family one time and somebody pointed and said, hey, you're Jason. So the horror, horror, horror knows our faces. Mm -hmm. Uh, The folks that are just fans are just enthusiastic about it. But when they meet you, they're like, oh, I got to tell you, my mom and I sat and watched that when I was 13. And, you know, this is a 40-year-old man talking to me or a 50-year-old woman. Yeah. And this year I did do one convention uh, before the bottom dropped out. And a young man came up to me who was seven years old, Aaron, seven, wearing a hockey mask with his dad. Uh, so it's a very large variety of seven-year-olds to 70-year-olds that, you know, are horror fans and everything in between. So it's, it's a real pleasure, real honor, and I'm uh, very lucky to be here. It's funny you say that about the seven-year-old. I have a niece that's six. She'll be, yeah, she's six. She's never seen the Jason movies. I think she, my brother let her play the game like once or twice, but she knows the mask. Like, as a matter of fact, the intro for my podcast, it has me talking. And at the very end, she, she says, uh, oh, it's Jason's mask. And my, my brother, like, did the intro part for me. He did it. And he said, because he, he originally sent me that video video of her, like, looking at the mask. Because I, I had a, um, 
a pink mask that I painted and ended up giving it to her. And she he sent me the video of her when she said this about, like she was about two or three years old when she was saying that. And I was like, Can you put this on the intro of my podcast? But like at the very end, I was like, I'm that has to stay there from here on out. Yeah, and, there, there, and that seven year old had never seen the movie. I asked the dad, has he seen it? No. Yeah. Um, I will tell you another fun story is that I'll have a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old, and they're all stoked about meeting Jason. And well, ha have you seen the movie? And they'll look at me and their parents behind them and they don't want to lie. <laughs> and you kind of got them caught like, uh, never mind, never mind. Yeah. You know, just like that, because they're like, and the, the, the question is they all have social media. They all know how to use YouTube, whatever. So they've seen, or they've played the game, but the parent doesn't know about it. And so the parent just kind of goes, but the parent who's taught them about Jason, they just may have not seen the movie. There's actually uh, another one of my, um, was my, he's one of my, he's my best friend's nephew, but anyway, him, his name is Jack. He's, I think he's about eight or nine years old now. Never seen, I don't think he's ever seen the Friday the 13th movies or horror movies in general, but just between YouTube and just reading stuff online, you can ask him just about any question and he'll just, he just knows. And it's just, it just amazes me. I remember when we left, the, we left the con and went to his house. I gave him a couple of things. And he was just giving us the rundown and a few things. And I was like, that's just so freaking cool. <laughs> I was like, that's so awesome. And yeah, I know. It, it is. And Aaron, it's pretty cool. It, it's, it's a, like I said, I was lucky. Uh, I got the part. I had to perform. I'm fortunate. I believe I performed well. And the rest is history. You know, it really is. Here we are. So, you know, like I always tell people, you know, credentials are important. Mm -hmm. uh, work history is important. But at the end of the day, there's some luck. And oh. once you get it with the luck, you got to perform. And I think we did a good job. I, I agree. Do you have a favorite scene from part six? Yeah, I do. Actually, the very, very first scene that I was in uh, my first time on the set. And that's the scene where Jason profile steps into camera frame. He turns and looks at the motor home and tilts his head and starts walking towards it. That was my very, very first scene on the set never been in a movie in my life and i'll always remember that because tom mclaughlin said and action and i'll always remember that one okay i want you to walk in i want you to stop here i want you to turn and then i want you just to tilt your head a little bit not a lot mm -hmm. uh he says a quarter inch is going to show and then i want you just to start walking towards that motorhome intensely like you're just going to flip it and the rest is history that's awesome. If I had to, my favorite scene from that movie, minus the kills, is probably when you're standing on that same RV on the side of it. That was. I think, a, yeah, I, that's the most majestic, in my opinion. It's just that's a poster. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's such an iconic scene. Like that's, it's one of those scenes where you would watch it, you know, when it's getting ready to come on the USA Network, for example, that they show in the commercial, and you're just standing there. I'm just like, oh, that, that's that's that had to, that was so cool. Yeah, and we, we were fortunate. We only had one motorhome to flip, so you got to do it right. And uh, when we got it down and I got inside, they took the bolts off the door. The question was, were we going to have to make a fake door or did it have enough power to force that door in the air far enough that it didn't look hokey? Uh, that was me. There was no magic. That was just me squatting down on a, on a big box and with my fist hitting full force as I stood up and fortunately I hit evenly and that door flew, what, four, five feet in the air. Mm -hmm. And then I had to step out <laughs> without slipping, falling or looking goofy. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough to get that one step, one foot under my leg and I lifted straight up, walked to the edge and just stood there. And that was the, la the last shot we did of the morning because the sun was getting ready to, to bust up over those trees. Wow. Wow. I, I always wonder how those scenes work, too. I'm like, okay, so how did he get this door off? Like, what did they do? Did they have to make a – I think about that now as I'm older. As a kid, you're just like, oh, my goodness. But now – Yeah, now we just took the bolts off. Um, true story. That's it. Nothing else. Uh, give you another quick uh, little thing. When you see me break the windshield in the uh, Volkswagen – well, Tom asked me, 
Well, Tom McLaughlin, the writer directs said, CJ, all right, you have a real spear. That's a real windshield. Do you think you might be able to get it through? And, you know, not everybody's has that strength. And I was like, yeah, I can, I pretty sure I can. He goes, if you can't, we'll, we'll, we'll cut it right there and then we'll put a breakaway windshield and it will do it again. I said, okay. I did that. When I hit that windshield, it exploded. <laughs> <laughs> and the force of me hitting it and going down momentum wise moved me from over the steering wheel and my spear went right through the passenger seat. Mm. Thank goodness the stuntman ducked all the way down mm -hmm. and nobody, I mean, that was that close because yeah. they were told to duck, go all the way down into the floorboard, no matter what, because I was hitting right above the steering wheel. But again, momentum took me across motion from the steering wheel into the passenger seat. So thank goodness nobody got hurt, but that was one of those scenes where I was forceful enough to put it through, but you know, when you start using that much power behind something, you lose control. That's awesome. I'm loving that Jason standing behind you too, by the way. That's my alter ego. <laughs> That's, oh man. How are, yeah. are you a big fan of the, um, the fan films? I mean, I know you were in Vengeance, but the other Friday the 13th fan films that have been coming out? You know, it's not that I'm not a fan. I just haven't really seen them. Uh, I'm familiar with Never Hike Alone because I know, uh, uh, the gentleman that played Jason. Of course, I know Tom Matthews and uh, uh, Carla, his lovely wife. They're friends of my wife's and mine. And so I see him at conventions periodically and Carla. Um, but the nice thing about it is uh, the fan films have become so powerful. And in today's technology, you've been able to shoot a film reasonably of quality because everything is digitalized. In the old days, you had to have all the cameras and all the 5K lights and all the, the cameras now, they have the... Uh, technology to be much more simplistic uh so they've got some pretty good products out there with these fan films i agree i love them and i think a big a big reason why i love them is because it's fans that are creating these films fan you know by the fan, excuse me even though the, some of them have the indiegogo backing and all that's cool which i think is amazing i love backing that stuff but i just love that we get fans of the actual like you know they're fans of the genre they're doing something and i think that's just it just makes it so much better for me. And I love how they're doing Friday the 13th. Cause I'm just like, that's such an awesome franchise. Why not? But yeah, we, all we can do is, you know, it's been uh, 10 years, 11 years since uh, Friday. And, you know, there are our two principals, of course, everybody knows Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller and Mr. Cunningham mm -hmm. both have had rights, uh, certain monetary and writing rights to the script, the movie. And some of the laws and things have shifted over the years, which, left it open a little bit. So now there's unfortunate where one says I do and the other says I do. And until they resolve their two issues, we're in a standstill, unfortunately. So the fans have picked up the torch to continue forward. Uh, you know, I ran casino resorts for many years. When I retired three and a half years ago, you know, I was a chief operating officer over a couple of casinos, general manager, um, give or take 2,500 employees. So I understand management. I understand leadership. I understand $100 million corporations. I've run them. You know, um, and I understand contracts and legalities. I'm hoping that Mr. Miller and Mr. Cunningham remember that the, the wonderful thing about them having their agreements or disagreements is the fact the fans embraced Friday the 13th since way back, what, 1980? And if we didn't have that embracement, they wouldn't have anything to argue about. Very true. Uh, so with that being said, you know, um, hopefully they'll come to some type of terms and get another one booked. And or at least get a couple shot and put them on the shelf and for distribution of one and then a couple years of distribution of another. Uh, but that's not my call, but that's a business decision. But again, running, you know, billion dollar casino resorts, I look at it a little differently, but I understand the logistics and it's unfortunate, but I, I, I never forget who helped me get to the top of that totem pole. Not was it just being good and lucky, but my team, my employees. Mm -hmm. That 2,000 to 2,500 employees, depending on which casino resort I was running, are the ones that put me in that position because of my successes. Uh, and don't forget the people that work with you and for you, and don't ever forget where you've come from. I agree with that. I agree with that 100%. Now, before we started recording, we were talking about Kane Hodder a little bit. Who? You know, the, the guy who played Jason after you? 
Oh, there was there was a movie after part six? Yeah. Damn. I thought I was the only one. I thought they just started on part six and that was it. Oh, uh, no. Mr. Hotter. My, hey, Kane and I are good friends, but yeah, what was the, what are you going to say? Just, um, I know you were saying you're going to tell me a story about how you punked him. I, you know, Kane and I get along wonderfully. I mean, I, I consider him a, a, a true professional friend. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't hang out and have dinner and, but I really, uh, every few months we text each other or we see each other at convention and, you know, I, he knows I did part six. Uh, he's very familiar with my my capabilities, and I do give him a hard time when we go to conventions because he did play four, and he's very serious about the part. You know, I'm more relaxed, laid back, and King takes it very serious. He still has the image when he walks around, and I, I'm real harsh on him about it. But I know we did Monster Mania a couple years back, and he was over by the bathrooms, right? And uh, he's got two tables. Well. I went over and took one of my pictures, turned it over and put Kane's office with arrows and taped it right above the bathroom, (laughs) right next to a table. And people kept going, asking him, he didn't get it. Finally, he looked up there and he knew it was me because my photo on the other side, BJ, he screams all the way across the tent, (laughs) BJ. Oh man. So, and and I give him a hard time. Don't misconstrue. I love him. I think the world of him He's a good man, but you know what? I'm probably one of the only people that harasses him and gives him a hard time that he appreciates it because I don't mean any harm by it. I would never mean to disrespect somebody. And I mean, not really. I mean, I make something goofy and say, Oh, I don't know, but it's not intentional. So I'm saying I feel bad if I hurt somebody's feelings, but you know, he'll be late to the sh- uh, show on Saturday. he will be an hour late. I'm sitting there doing autographs and he's got a line going. I'll stand up and say, excuse me one second. I'll go over to his line and say, guys, guys, listen, Kane's constipated. As soon as he gets the prune juice working, he'll be down. And they'll bust up. And then Kane walks up 20 minutes later, and they're all laughing. He doesn't get it until someone says, well, he said you had constipation. Oh, BJ. <laughs> I like that. I like that back and forth because stuff like that makes it fun for the fans. It makes it real fun. And, and it's fun for Kane because he does take it seriously, and he is a good man. I mean, I really love him like a, a stepbrother from another mother. But he's, he just, he's fun for me because he's so easy. I mean, I'm so low key. Yeah. I'm 6'3", 6'4", 250. It's not like I'm, I'm not looking for a brawl, but I'm your best friend in a bar fight. Um, But if I bump into you or something, I'm, I apologize. You know, it's like, I, like today's era, Aaron, I wear a mask everywhere. I would, I don't know. I don't care about my right not to wear a mask or wear a mask. I would feel terrible, Aaron, if I didn't wear a mask and I got you sick. I don't care about getting myself sick. I'm more worried about infecting somebody else. I don't mean to, but I'd feel bad about that because why would I want to intentionally not wear a mask when I could stop if I had a virus or asystematic passing that on to you. And it's not about, well, it's my right. My right is to protect you and be respectful of you. Keyword respect. Yeah. So I look at it that way, you know? Um, And like I said, when it comes to Kane, him and our buddies, I know everybody though. Derek Mears, great man, got married a couple of years ago. He's as funny as heck. Uh, you know, Ken, who did Freddy versus Jason, of course, and Richard Booker passed away, as did Steve Dash. But Ari's out there having a good time. Uh, you know, Ted White, it's been a couple of years since he was on the circuit. Um, and Richard and everybody that we do see from the different films, it's fun. It's a it's a real nice fraternity, I guess is a good word. And for me, I have respect for everybody. Those actors and actresses bust their bump, their hump. They really do. No, I believe you. I really do. And I, I appreciate every single one of you guys just not only getting to meet you guys, but putting on such a wonderful performance in these movies and getting, I mean, something for us to talk about. Like, that, that's one of the stories I never, ever, ever get tired of is the, the Jason Voorhees story, you know, the beginning of certain some of the movies where they have the campfire and they're talking about the legend of Jason and all that. I'd never get sick of that. As many times as I've seen the movie, as many variations as you hear of that story from, you know, from the original films to the fan films and all that stuff. I, I just love it. It's just something you'd never get sick of. I still watch these movies to this day. Like usually I'll try to, I mean, I'll watch them at any time of the year, but Friday the 13th, I try to watch as many as I can on that day. There's been times where I've taken days off of work. I've like, look, I got to take Friday off. It's a holiday. <laughs> it's Friday the 13th. Exactly. I have stuff to do. 
watching Friday the 13th all day. And it's just, it became like a tradition to where like it started with me as, you know, with my siblings, friends and all that to now, like my wife and I will watch the Friday the 13th films, including the fan films, like that whole Friday the 13th weekend. And it's just, it's awesome. I just love it. <laughs> I really do, man. I got to no, it, it really, thank, it, you, thank you for it. Yeah. It might, it, you know, I, play, I appreciate it. It's a genre. Um, the nice thing about the Friday the 13th that I did, I was fortunate enough to do part six. Uh, you may or may not think about it, but there is no nudity in mine. And there's no, there's two swear words in the total film. Mm -hmm. So it is somewhat user friendly for littler people, but part six, that's why I always laugh. I think part six was, I think I was fortunate in the fact that Jason became a principal to the series, to the movie in part six. I think everybody was really looking to see what Jason was going to look like and do next uh, more than just seeing who the camp counselor was and how many kills Jason was going to do was an important feature. You got to remember part six. I'm very fortunate. I've got the opening like James Bond. Yes. Uh, I get to come back to life like Frankenstein. I get to have a rock and roll hall of famer, Mr. Alice Cooper do the music and I get to wear a Batman utility belt. How cool is that? Hey, that's, that's awesome. Jason and Batman. That, that'd be an interesting combo right there. Well, think about it. I mean, I'm wearing that utility belt with all the weapons and yeah. knife and machete and darts. It's a Batman utility belt. Hey, I, I like it. I like the way that's a that's Jason's utility belt. <laughs> that's awesome, though. So, but I will tell you one of the the cool things about the Friday the Thirteenth, Aaron, is that the fans are huge. I mean, it's just unequivocally an honor to be a Jason and uh, just uh, humbly appreciative you know, of the amount of love and respect that comes towards you because you play Jason. And as we were talking earlier, the amount of different genres, purple, green, or blue, that are engaged in dialogue and communication at a convention, that it's a really nice, warm environment of people enjoying themselves. Nobody's drawing a line because your face is purple, green, or blue, and you're wearing a 20-inch pair of heels, even if you're a guy that's 6'6". Six, six, they don't care. They really I don't. mean, these costumes, I had a gentleman come up to me at a show and he was uh he came in and he was predator and it was an awesome costume i mean it was like whoa and i said guy i i just gotta ask you man how much do you pay for that if you don't mind he goes three thousand dollars this man spent three thousand dollars for this costume to be made and it was truly amazing mm -hmm. but my like you were saying that's his thing that's your thing you take friday the 13th off i'd rather you take friday the 13th off than labor day weekend if you're working in the hospitality industry yeah, you know, I mean, I need you for the weekend in that casino. I'm busier than anything on a, on a three or four day holiday. So if you just want Friday the 13th off, that's your passion. Great. You know, that's a pleasure. And But to you, Friday the 13th has substance. You and your wife, it has meaning. And that's what's so, so just cool about it. It's just a lot of people, seven years old to 70 years old, again, purple, green or blue from Venus, Pluto or Mars have the same embracement as we do. Which I think I, I find that so awesome because again, going back to my childhood of watching these movies on Friday the Thirteenth, where it came on the USA Network, to being an adult, still doing the same thing, but watching the DVDs, mm -hmm. and you're not, <coughs> excuse me, you're not the only one doing it. Like you go on social media, starting out with part six today, I'm starting out with part whatever, and I just I just think that's so cool how that's like that's still going for over 30 years. So you could say from 19, I mean, I don't know if it started in the eighties, but I'll say from when me in the nineties up to 2020 and people are still doing it. And I know they're going to continue to do that. And it, it's, it's just, it's just so cool. It's similar with like Halloween. I try to watch as many Halloween movies as I can either in the month of October, but especially on Halloween, I try to watch, you know, try to watch a few of them. And it's just, it's just one of those things where it's like those iconic franchises, which I say the big three, uh, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Halloween, you know, those are like the ones that I'm not gonna say they started the slasher, but I feel like they took it to that next level of well, I guess you could say Halloween kind of started, but I mean they they all took it to that next level to where it's just everybody knows who Jason, Michael, and Freddie are. And I mean that we all have our favorites. Mine's Jason. I'm correct, they're wrong, which I love joking with people about that. But it's well, I know that like some of the Michael Myers, you know, uh, you know, Nick and uh tyler and but i gotta tell you about that you know i mean they are related to me 
Uh, they are cousins of a second mother somewhere down our pipe. But I will tell you, I want you just to always remember this. And it came, you heard this from Jason. All right. You ready? Yep. All right. Make sure you record this. Oh, I am. Real men, real men use a machete, not an outback steak knife. Exactly. Don't ever forget that. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I had a t-shirt made at a show one time with Michael Myers on it. <laughs> and I sat there and autographed and everybody was like, uh, aren't you Jason? I go, yeah, read the shirt. And they love it. <laughs> See, so cool. I always give my second brothers from a mother of a cousin hard time when I see him about using an outback steak knife compared to my machete. I so you should, as you should. Like, you're like, what are we having dinner? <laughs> <laughs> yep. And that's I didn't th see this type of stuff here. That's what I like about you is because you have so much. When you go to these cons, you're going there to have a great time. You're not. I mean, for yourself to have a great time, but you're also entertaining the fans with the banter with the other celebrities there and just I feel like you're just being yourself kind of just letting loose and I, I like that environment at these cons because I feel like a lot of people are like that and it's just well, it's you got to remember you know I ran casino resorts as I said earlier uh, oh, COO general manager and again suit and tie uh, I you know have to take care of responsibilities you know I, I'll get a phone call at one two in the morning that I'm losing a half a million dollars or that this player wants another million dollar credit line. So for me, that was a responsibility, not only to the owners, but to the employees, their children, their families, when it came to wages and 401k plans and health plans. So when I get to do a show, <laughs> for me, it was fun. I mean, I got to take the suit off, put a t-shirt on, you know, run around with tattoos and people were like, <sighs> and then when my employees would find out that I played Jason, I can't tell you how many times employees would, politely walk up to me walking through the resort or the casino and say, Mr. Graham, could I get your autograph or do you have any pictures? You know, my sister is a huge fan. <laughs> and I always had promo pictures in my desk because again, humbly appreciative. You think that, but for me, it was another way of, like I said earlier, a connectivity of different genres. Mm -hmm. I mean, this person is a, you know, a hostess or a dishwasher or a waiter, a waitress, bartender, and it's an approachable piece to have communication with, quote unquote, you know, the top office, you know, the guy in the glass tower. Well, this is true. I had the tower that I worked in and lived in uh, and when I was in my office, but I always spent 40% of my day on the floor, no matter what. 40% of my day was walking the floor, talking to my team, going to the kitchens, going through the back areas and meeting the customers and my employees uh, and coming in and talking to new employees that were being hired. 40% of my day because that were that was going to be the people that were going to make me look great. And they did. And, and I can't say enough of my team because my team was part of my success. And that that's very, very respectable because you have, you have higher ups that are just higher ups. They're just, I'm up, I'm up here. You know, you're below, you want, you want to talk to me. You got to go through these 20 people or whatever. And you're just like, listen, I'm a, these people right here are why you're up here because you know, Somebody I was always, up here. yeah, I was always approachable. I, I had a general manager one time at uh, the Flamingo and I was a casino manager. So I wasn't, you know, I was, I was up the food chain, but he was the boss, boss, boss. Mm -hmm. I never saw that person on the floor except maybe walk through once a week. I never saw that person on the weekends when everybody was working the busy shifts and that's okay. I mean, he was a general manager. He didn't really need to. But for me, it's a personal connectivity to the team. You have to remember, don't ever forget where you came from, Aaron. When I started in the casino industry, I was a security guard. And then I went into dealing cards at Circus Circus in Reno wearing a friggin' pink shirt. So to start at those levels and then go all the way up to be the person in the tower, um, you know, I worked hard. Don't misconstrue. I made a couple of mistakes, as we all do. But I, I was very good at what I did, and I was very lucky at what I did, and I always made sure I had great people around me. But most importantly, Aaron, I always tried to teach my senior executives three words, and those three words that I've always tried to teach my executives were qualify, quantify, and simplify. And if you look at your business, and you look at your business plan, your mission, your mission statement, you're, and you run it with those three words, there's no reason why you can't succeed, because the last word, simplify, why has it got to be complicated? Make sure everybody understands the mission. 
And I brought that home from being in the military 46 years ago. You got to understand the mission. The whole battalion has to understand the mission, not just the squad. Uh, otherwise, somebody's going to get hurt. Very true. <clears throat> and back to what you were just saying about how you'd come and, you know, 40% of your time was on the floor. The cool Always. Part, the good thing about that, too, is it makes people want to work harder for you because you're not just hiding in your I'm not just saying that they're just hiding in your office doing nothing, but you're not just hiding in your, your office because – if they're not seeing you, they don't know. They're just thinking, okay, this guy's just barking orders. He doesn't know what's really going on. But you're seeing what's going on. You're understanding. You're, you know, you're like you said, you're building these relationships. You have, you're doing autographs for people, which I think is just cool. Like, yeah, you know, maybe I, maybe I can't sign the autograph right now, but I promise I'll sign it, you know, at a better time or whatever the case may be. And I, I like that because just me being an employee, I've always tried to have a cool, somewhat cool relationships, at least with my supervisors or whatever the case may be just so you have that comfortability with them and mm -hmm. what, what you do you have that come you know people have that comfortability with you to where it's just like i remember working in places to where say when a higher up came in some people would be like oh well, we got to do this we got to do that we got to do this and i'm the type of person i'm like no i'm not gonna just put on this fake facade for the person i'm gonna go up there i'm gonna talk to them i shake their hand and be myself and you either like me or you don't and i was always good at that like i was always good with that it just I couldn't do the whole fake, you know, just let's let's make sure we do this. this. It's like, well, if you're already doing your job the way you're supposed to do your job and then you just, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated, you're fine. But if you're someone who gets all tense because somebody who makes more money than you, I guess you could say pretty much comes in the door. That's not good. No. Well, that's that's one thing about playing Jason, the same concept that I'm playing it forward is, you know, being humble and, and talking to people at the cons and, and they see that you're a real person, it really, they embrace you even more. They like you even more as Jason now. Now you may become their favorite Jason, you know? Um, so I do embrace that. I will tell you a true story. The last two casinos that I had as a general manager, chief operating officer, uh, one was in Palm, uh, Rancho Mirage and one was in Palm Springs. And every three months, maybe four months, I'd go put on a uniform and work with the team members. And I'm not exaggerating. When I was working with the back of the house people, I put yellow gloves on and scrubbed the toilets with them in the bathrooms. And they were like, oh, no, Mr. Graham, we got that stuff. I was in the military. I can scrub a toilet. Yeah. And they were like watching me get on my hands and knees, scrub on a toilet, you know, in the employee uh, bathrooms. And they're like, can we record this? I go, absolutely. I'm, I mean, I scrub toilets in the, in the, the military. I can clean a urinal, partner. Yeah. Um, so it shocked them that I was only getting on my hands and knees with a pair of yellow gloves, just like them. I worked with another department and walked around and cleaned slot machines, another department as security, walking out chips. I even went out and dealt cards one time, just letting them know that I've done their jobs, I've been there, um, and they do exactly what you say. You have to re realize, Aaron, um, I, from my experience, there's, there's five things which employees look for in their job, and, and wages is not number one, just so you know. Wages is number five. Everything above that is respect, opportunity, acknowledgement, and good benefits. And then it comes wages. Which I do understand. And if you give them respect and they see that you, listen, listen, I can't do everything that everybody wants all the time because there's, there's restraints that I can only do monetarily. That doesn't mean your idea is not great. Here's my challenge with your idea. I don't have $2 million to replace the entire POS system in the casino. However, I am budgeting every year to get this done. So over a three-year window, I can replace that entire IT system that we have. Um, but if they hear the acknowledgement, remember I said qualify, quantify, simplify. Mm -hmm. Now you're quantifying why you can't do it. And you're simplifying your answer in an explanation form that anybody should understand rather than give them a bunch of ad tids that, that nobody really uses except if they're maybe a college grad. And just for the record, I'm not. Yeah. No, I get that, though. And I like how you said that wages wasn't the most important thing for people. But I, I love how you mentioned opportunities. And people want opportunities. They want promotional opportunities. They want acknowledgement. They want respect. And they want, they want uh, raises, merit raises. Mm -hmm. Most people, from my experience, don't want COLA, cost of living allowance. They don't. Everybody just gets 3% because there are some people that do the job. There's some people that exceed expectations and they should receive more to be fair. I agree. So the last casino resort I ran, I, I had my employees vote 
and I had meetings and I said, guys, here's my options. I can give COLA, cost of living allowance, 3% across the board. Or I can do merit raises. The merit raise is John over here may get 5% and John over here may only get 2%. Mm -hmm. John's doing the job, but John over here is exceeding and worth more. So I let them put it to a vote with human resources. And unfortunately or fortunately, it depends on what side of the, you, they wanted merit raises. They wanted to be given a raise based on their performance skill set and their hard work rather than just having one year tenure or two year tenure. Um, and it, for me, I like the idea personally because I work hard. I'm worth 5%. And I know there are some people that just come in and do their job and I think they're worth 2%. They're doing their job. They're doing their qualifications of their position, not in a bad way, but they're a B student. They're doing their job. This yeah. person over here is an A plus student. I'd like to reward them for being an A plus student. That's part of those opportunity to come along for promotional purposes. Excuse me. What you're saying, what you're saying right there with the merit versus the all across the board, the merit thing makes people work harder because it's like, okay, as long as I'm doing my job, busting my ass, I know I'm going to get a raise and I'm going to get a raise that they feel I deserve versus if we all get the same raise, I work hard. I, I, I outwork everybody. These guys just do what they have to do to get by, which is fine. But I feel like I should make more. That's going to make you, that's going to make that one hardworking employee either go somewhere else or kind of just start slacking because it's like, what's the point? If I'm doing, say, double the work of somebody all the time, every day, doing double the work, double the work, you know, to even picking up shifts for people, whatever the case may be. And then, you know, this person's just kind of just, Doing what they doing what they have to do to keep the job, and we're getting the same raise. It's that's not fair. That's not fair at all. And you know, it isn't in in for me personally as a leader. Um, my executives, my managers, my department managers, my supervisors and managers below. They had to be able to remember I said qualify, quantify, simplify. They had to be able to quantify why John got five percent and quantify why Joe, John only, the other side only got 2%. You better have some documentation in the file that the one you want to give 2% or no percent uh, is, has been verbally coached or written up in the file or late multiple times, whatever the case may be, the infraction. Because if you got no documentation as a manager, then that you can't prove it. That ain't fair. That's very true. And you can't give this other person 5% and they've got a file with multiple infractions in it. So it kind of helpfully would take away from um, favoritism. And it'll never be perfect, Aaron. Always remember, it'll never be perfect. All right. But my human resources department, my vice president of human resources, understand I sat down with her multiple times. We set up kind of an SOP and understanding multiple levels of infractions and consistencies with those infractions throughout all the departments. So if somebody had an infraction, they could ask HR, what did we do last time with this infraction? And they were given the same uh, information so it could be implemented the same way throughout. Now, is it ever going to be perfect? No. But I did our best uh, as a team with about 2,000 employees at those resorts to make you feel that you weren't being uh, taken advantage of unfavorably or even discriminatorily. Um, in my casino industry, we didn't, that I worked in, that I was in charge of, I never looked at a person if they were purple, green, or blue um, the pay was the pay. <laughs> I never even thought of that. I mean, it didn't even cross my mind. I don't know if I'm stupid, but if you had the qualifications and you were getting the job making uh, director of food and beverage, it's about 140,000 a year plus bonus. It had nothing to do with tall, short, medium, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so when I do hear that, unfortunately, the last three years, it's kind of come to a lot of the front forefront. It's unfortunate, but I never it just never dawned on me. I guess I was either stupid or it just, I never saw that purple, green, or blue. I, the job pays X and you're the best qualified for the job and you got it. <laughs> yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, that's how the world should be. Unfortunately it's not, but I will say I'm, <clears throat> I am liking that uh, the people that are against the whole purple, green, and blue, so to speak, that are like against that, you, you, those people uniting, let's say, I'm glad they're getting called out and I'm glad that they're losing a lot of stuff because it's like, Hey, look, this is how you're treating every other, everybody else. Now people know who you really are. And now, you know, if it's something that's a business owner, you're going to lose your business. You're going to get fired. Like people aren't, people aren't going for that kind of stuff anymore all over, which I think is great. 
and kind of unite just like how horror does. I just, you know what, you can call it ignorance. I mean, I, I grew up, um, my dad died in 1960, so I never had a father. So I, I don't, doesn't even phase me. I don't want to hear excuses. Mm -hmm. I went in the military 46 years ago. I have a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. um, I've been very successful, period. Uh, I am retired, you know, at my choice. I could have continued to work. But at 60, I said, hey, you know, I ran a spreadsheet, said I can live really good like this, or I can keep working until I live really, really good. Well, really good is better than most to begin with. So, um, but I worked hard. I took promotions. I worked nights. I worked graveyard. Whatever I could do to become value and move up in the ranks, you know. But, you know, mother raised two boys on Social Security in the 60s. In 1974, I went off in the military. And I never looked back. You know, so I have no excuses. I don't make excuses. Um, you know, there are some folks that use uh, an excuse as a crutch. And there are some that have valid claims. Always be fair about that. There are some very valid claims out there. Don't just put everybody in the same box. That's not fair. You definitely um, individuals you definitely, have to be looked at. But yeah, what's that? No, I was gonna say you with the whole. Excuse but I always work hard. I was gonna say with the excuse thing, you definitely can't put everybody in the same box. Because there's people who have physical or mental. I'm, I'm not even gonna call them an excuse, but disabilities, whatever the case may be, they do what they can. But then there's some people who just <laughs> do. They do what. They do the bare minimum because they can get away with doing the bare minimum. I'll say that. And I mean... Go back to the word cost of living allowance and a merit raise. You're right. So again, it's not perfect, my friend. Um, and it's unfortunate. And we have a lot of work to equalize, stabilize. Um, but I personally, you know, uh, whatever people may say, I, I didn't have... I didn't ever saw it like that. I was. My mom never taught me that you know, gee, John Wayne de deserves more than Susan Summers. Mm -hmm. That was never even in my yeah. my window. <laughs> I, I was like, really? I mean, but to hear that, it's unfortunate because my industry and the casino industry that I came out of, I never saw that in my, where I was in charge and I was, you know, I was a vice president at the Palms. I worked for Steve Wynn, Caesars. Uh, like I said, general manager a couple of times, chief operating officer. When you're under my watch, uh, if you were the best partner, you're in, you know, um, period. Um, everybody's expectations were as equal as we could. And, and it's, it's challenging to be fair to a lot of people. And it's sad to a lot of people at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that hard work pays off and so does luck. I'll always say that. So does luck. Yeah, definitely. Like I, that's one thing my father always told me as a kid and still tells me to this day as a grown man is you can do anything you want in this world. You just have to work hard at it. Nothing come, nothing that's worth having comes easy. And that's very true. And I mean, well, you I, know, I, I always laugh because not everybody can play basketball. Not everybody's going to be in the NBA, that's true. Uh, but everybody thinks they can get a driver's license. <laughs> very true. <laughs> you know, not everybody can drive. Damn it. <laughs> it is what it is. I mean, it, but you know what, uh, Aaron, you know, to summarize it, I'm, life is good. I'm having a good time. I have a ranch in Montana. Uh, we didn't talk about that. I have horses. Uh, I have alpacas. I have bees, beehives. Uh, you know, so for me, I'm in a good space. I'm fortunate. I worked hard to get here, but I'm still healthy. Uh, if Tom McLaughlin, uh, you know, gets to do part 13, as we talked earlier, we've had this conversation about doing the role. Uh, physically, partner, I'm still the same. I'm six four in the morning when I wake up, six three when I go to bed. Um, I'm two fifty. I was about two forty three when I did the movie. Um, so, like Tom and I've had the conversation, and he's talked about it out there openly that if he gets the opportunity for part thirteen, uh, he will entertain. He'd like me to step into the role if if I feel that I have the physicality to do it. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm like your father. I'm not a young man. Uh, you know, you probably tuck and roll when you fall down. When I fall down, I go thump. <laughs> I'm I'm pretty uncoordinated, so I pretty much do the same. I might get up a little a little bit quicker than you because I'm a little yeah, bit exactly, probably a lot quicker because I'm gonna lay there and make sure everything's still working. But uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, <laughs> now where I'm just like, oh damn, I just felt, I got to be more careful now because I know getting older, you have to be a lot more careful. My my father is gonna be seventy seven actually next Wednesday. Wow. And 
like just growing up, you know, when you're a kid, you're picking up heavy stuff. What do you don't lift with your back? What do you do as a kid? You do it anyway. <laughs> and now I'm starting to feel those stupid things. I'm like, okay, I got to be more careful. My first convention of 2021, as long as everything goes forward, I've, I've contracted to do Days of the Dead, the end of February in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, which happens to be about 35 miles, give or take, from Covington, Georgia, where we shot the movie. Oh, that's so um, I will tell you that if I get the opportunity, uh, I'll seriously consider, Aaron, as long as I know that I can deliver to you, the fans, a quality of either better or as good as I did in part six. Otherwise, I'd have to humbly say no thank you. But I will tell you, if I get the opportunity and I feel I can give you a performance, uh, I promise you I'll be using football tape on my knees and my ankles. Smart move. I'm you know, <laughs> something I didn't do back then because now I know how to tape it. And, yep. you know, but I promise you I'll be taped up pretty good. But we'll see what happens. I keep my fingers crossed. I'd like to do it because it is part 13. Uh, to have the resurrection of Jason coming back. Jason never dies after Jason lives. Um, it would be really um, an honor, but I, I really got to give you a deliverance of a performance. Otherwise, I don't want to embarrass myself, to be quite honest. Now, would you, if, say, say the movie does happen, right, and say you just felt you couldn't play the role, would you do a cameo? I do whatever Tom McLaughlin asked me because I've been so appreciative that he gave me the job in 1986 and that I was, I did a good job. And t today we still talk about it. No, you didn't do a good job. You did an amazing job. Cause that was Thank just, I, I honestly feel like with the Friday the 13th franchise, everybody had their own standout performances for each film they were in. And there's memorable moments. Like for me, again, part six, one moment that really, really stands out this right here. <laughs> and then um, the, when you're standing on the RV, which is right here. Yeah. Thank you. Those were just huge moments. And I'm just like, wow, that's just, and it's cool to like, it's cool to sit here and talk to you and you just tell me a few things that happened during these movies and just how, how the things happened. Like the, tell me like the little secrets. That's another thing I'm starting to really appreciate more now. Or I'm starting to love a lot more now, especially with like Blu-rays and DVDs where you get to see like the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. 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 It works. I think that's, that's such a cool thing. It's such a cool thing. I'm just like, wow. And it, it is. I think and it, it, the cool thing about it is, you know, again, we're talking about this and, and how cool is that? I mean, how humbling is it that I've got fans, like I said, young, old, in the medium, in the medium. Um, it's just, you kind of lay back and go, wow. I mean, I sit in my office and I look at all my little history of things that I've done and it's fun. It's like your little museum, I call it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know what? You don't realize what you've accomplished until you sit down like I have in the last couple, three years and look on the walls and they are you know, BS, if you want to talk about it that way, but you kind of go around and you go, geez, man. All right. <laughs> All right. But you know what? I never stopped. I keep thumping, uh, you know, I, on the walls, I've got all the different things I've got. You may not know this, but in 1987, I was with Chippendales in Culver city, know that. So, LA. So I've got my cuffs and collars and color pictures over here on the wall that have been framed. Uh, my wife, she was a bud girl back then. I've got her Budweiser uniform over here with a, a small photo of her and the girls doing Budweiser things. But you kind of look back and go, really? Oh, God. <laughs> you, you know what's cool about that, though, is you get to see your growth throughout the years of what you've accomplished in life. Like from right. point A to point B. It's like from your baby picture to your picture now and just seeing right. everything in between of how you've grown and just accomplished so many things. And I would even say possibly probably changed so many, so many lives just from the Friday the 13th film alone, just as a fan sitting down watching that movie. Like there's people that probably there, I'm sure I'm, I can guarantee there's fan, you know, fan film creators that are just like, because of this movie right here, I want to act. I want to direct or whatever the case may be because of this movie right here. And that's because it's something that you did just playing a role. Like you said, luck, you have to be lucky, but you also have to, once you get that luck there, you have to do the talent. You have to play the part. You have to earn that spot, and you earn that spot. Right. Well, look here, partner. In about two minutes, I yep. need to get set up for another – I have an 8 o'clock interview. Oh. So when, when I sign off with you, I'm going to go back in and see – I have one more done tonight. Jam, man. So I try to do them like when I sent to you. I try to do three on Thursday, okay. uh, six, seven, eight. 
And I do that because, you know, there are requests and I want to make sure I give it my all. I just don't want to sporadically do one every day or every couple days um, for two reasons. Number one, most importantly, it's hard on my schedule. I do have horses, you know, I do have barbed wire fencing to fix. Uh, I'm shoveling poop out of the pens and other things throughout the day. Um, so I try to nail it down, but I've got one that should be starting actually right about now when I close off. All I have to do is go back to Zoom, but if we could wind it down, I'd appreciate it, my man. Um, again, I'd like to thank you for putting me on the show. Uh, I hope you're able to edit out what you like and what you don't and add something to it how you want, but it's my pleasure. Um, been an honor, and I appreciate you, uh, not only your show, but I appreciate being a fan. I'm very honored you came on here. Very humbled. Thank you very much. I would love to do this again. Hopefully we can meet in person again. Okay. And, and as soon as I hang up, um, since I have to jump right to this next show, uh, within the next hour, um, I'll send you Tom's information. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. So when you get his phone number, I'll just reiterate, you know, text him, I introduce yourself and tell him, you, you know, you're coming through me. That way he knows you're legit. And then he'll reach back to you. Um, I promise you he will. He's a great guy. If you want to do a little research, he's done multiple movies. He's got a band called The Sloths, S-L-O-T-H-S right now. Uh, in the late 60s, he was playing at the Whiskey Gogo with his band. And in the last few years, he started the band up, so to speak. Awesome. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Tell the missus hello. Thank you both for being fans. I appreciate it so much. I will. All right, buddy. Thank you. Have a great night, man. You too, partner. Oh, that was so awesome, people. <laughs> that was so freaking humbling. That guy is so amazing. And I can't wait for you guys to see this episode. Oh, my goodness. I just got to say thank you guys for being a fan of mine. Thank you for being a fan of Horror Research 30. If you haven't seen Vengeance, go check it out. Watch Friday the 13th, every single, every single movie. One through all of them. And as you guys know, as always, I'll see.